So our next uh, talk is by uh, Judith uh, Senyes Pardo Diaz. Uh, she is a data scientist at um, the Spanish National Research Council, and uh, she'll be telling us about a pretty interesting platform that they have built on top of Flower that enables uh, around uh, 50 scientists, so 50 scientists doing do basic research, non-computer science, but in the kind of like different fields like chemistry and so on. It's a, a, it's a platform that allows these 50 scientists to uh, use distributed data for doing their types of uh, research uh, built on Flower. So thank you so much for joining us today, and we're really interested to hear what you have to say. So thank you very much, Nick, for the presentation, and thank you very much to all the Flower team for the invitation to talk about the implementation of uh, federated learning within the European Open Science Cloud. Sorry for these slides. And I would like to start by explaining what is the European Open Science Cloud, because probably most of you didn't know this, this ecosystem. And let's start by the objectives and the roadmap of the European Open Science, Open Science Cloud, the EOSC which aims to develop the web of fair, service and data, of fair and data services in order to enhance the science, the reproducibility, and the digital transformation we want to perform in Europe. So the implementation is a long-term process which is aligned and coordinated by the European Commission since 2015, and currently in the current phase, which is between 2021 and 2030, we are moving to a more, let's say, a stakeholder approach in which we want to share a common vision, common objectives, and mm, all in all, uh, perform complementary contributions at both the European, the national, and the institutional level. Also, I would like to note that also we say the European Open Science Cloud is not a cloud, and it's a, it, mm, the EOS is not a cloud provider, and it also doesn't own the data or the services that are involved in the products, but is an enable of, of that science that we are doing. And what, why are we interested in, in the EOS? What we want to achieve with this ecosystem first? We want to improve the scientific research that we are doing, and in order to do so, we want to facilitate it by accessing to more uh, um, to a greater amount of data sets, to a great amount of research results, which are quite important to improve the scientific research that we are doing in different fields. So we can be talking about uh, chemical, Im about chemical, about medical imaging, about a quite different diversity of data. Also, we want to foster the innovation that we are with doing. And in order to do so, we want to enhance the collaboration between researchers to publish in open access, to share, to build into others' work, and also in the same line to improve transparency and improve the reproducibility of the research that we are carrying. So also, another of the objectives is to reduce the duplication of the efforts, and in order to do so, we need to encourage data sharing and data reuse. And all in all, this will facilitate the interdisciplinary research and also the cross-sector <laughs> cross collaboration. And now I will talk about the artificial intelligence for the European Open Science Cloud project. That is the main objective of the talk. And this is a project which is founded by the European Commission, by the European Union, which runs from September 2022 to August 2025, during three, during three years. And within this, uh, pro, within this project, we want to provide scientists, we want to provide the users of the ei 4 us platform, which I'm going to show later, with advanced features to perform distributed federated learning. Of course, we are talking about federated learning. So, of course, distributed and federated learning, but also their tools, such as machine learning operations, such as metadata provenance, and so on. So in this slide here, you can see the five main objectives of the project, and I'm only going to focus on the second one, with which we want to support scientists to build AI systems, to build AI models, of course, machine learning, deep learning models, which can be trained on distributed data sets. So we have a particular focus on federated learning for this task. And in order to do so, we are using Flower for implemented the, the support for the federated learning part. 
Here you have the high level architecture of the platform that we are implementing. And here I just want to focus on the part of the federated learning. Here we have Flower as the framework that we are mainly using. But you can also know the different development environments that we are providing to the users. The users can develop their models both using, for example, JupyterLab, that is quite common, but also Visual Studio Code. And we are working on, on these development environments. Here you have the diagrams of the architecture, if you are interested, in the C4 model, which is quite, let's say, intuitive and, and accessible and interactive, of course. I have included this slide just uh, five minutes ago in order to show you what is the ai for us dashboard, because I have known that I'm explaining the ai for us project, but if you are a scientist and want to use the platform, where are you going to find? So when, we, when you log in into the platform, you have the different modules that are pre-trained modules with different AI, with different machine learning, deep learning models. For example, one image classifier, one audio classifier, and other modules applied to specific fields. For example, here, to classify conus species, to classify plants, etc. So this is what you can see when you enter the marketplace. But I want to focus on federated learning and Let's move then to how are we implementing federated learning in the platform. So first, where we start implementing federated learning in our platform, we encountered one problem which was related to the server and the proxy that we were using. So I'm going to be quickly into this, but as you know, with Flower, we are using gRPC. And in our case, the gRPC server was running behind the proxy, in our case, traffic, which acts as reverse proxy. In this line, the clients may not be able to connect with the server, so we perform some modifications to the Flower library that the solution that we propose is already included in the current version of Flower, so first problem solved. Then on the other hand, we find other problem when talking with our use cases, with the use cases that are on board in the project, and we thought about problems that can arise when different attackers act as clients. I mean, for example, let's imagine that we are working on creating a server and different clients, which are, for example, hospitals, want to create a machine or deep learning model and train it, a global model, using this federated learning server. How can we know if a different client which is connected is or not an attacker? So we decide to implement the authentication. So if you, we are acting as the server, we will need to give the different clients a password, let's say, a kind of token or secret that they will need to enter in order to be able to connect with the server. So only authenticated clients can connect with the server. In other case, uh, all the clients that have the IP in which the server is deployed will be able to connect to the server and they can even perform a poisoning attack. So in order to implement this part, we first implement what we call AI4 flower, which are some flower extensions in which we include bearer tokens for allowing the authentication. We also perform a modification in our own AI4 EOS Flower repo, in which we aim to manage the credentials that are needed in order to perform the authentication. And we also created a system for storage management. We use it Vault, which is from Harsicorp. I don't know if any of you know it, but we implemented it, and we integrate that, that system in, in our, of course, Vault is already created, and we just introduced it in our, in our deployments. So let's take a look on how can we perform a federated learning training within our platform. First, our main objective is to make federated learning easier to scientists, make it accessible to scientists, and make it more, more easy to use. So when you join the platform and want to perform a federated learning server, this is what you can see, federated learning server that will be deployed with Flower, and you just need to launch this tool. And you will see that there are some general steps, some general configuration that is quite intuitive, is quite user-friendly for the users, because first we have the general configuration in which we just need to introduce the title of the, the deployment, which will be the title that we have to identify our, our server, the description, and the service to run. Here we can select between JupyterLab, as I have already explained it, or between Visual Studio Code, or just Federated server will be a terminal for monitoring the process. Then we have the hardware configuration. In this case, as we are just starting the server, we don't need, in most cases, a specific hardware requirements. So just here we have the CPUs, RAM memory, and disk memory. But 
In other cases, for example, when we are starting the clients, we may need to have some, some GPUs and so on for training the models. And the last step is the most important one because these, here we can see that the users do not need to interact directly with the code, with Flower and with any code because here the user just needs to introduce the number of rounds of the federated learning training, the minimal number of clients, the evaluation metric that he or she want to use, more than one if, if needed, and the federated aggregation strategy. He or she can select between different aggregation strategies in order to run the federated learning server. And then we get our deployment, which is here, which is running, and we can see how can we start the server. Quite simple, just by running fe uh, Python 3 fed server, server.py. Then we have our federated learning server running, and we don't need to change anything in the code. It's already configured with these parameters. So I have uh, already talked about the secret management. So in order to perform the secret management system, we have here, how can we manage the secrets that we have created for this server? And we can add new secrets. For example, let's imagine again the case in, several, in which several hospitals are collaborating. Then if I'm the server, I will send to the first hospital one token, one, one kind of password, let's say, for he or she to connect. And the same for the other clients that are authenticated, that are involved. But in case that I have an untrusted client, then I can revoke the secret and that client will be never be able to connect again until I send them another secret. So this is our secret management and we can create more, revoke secret and so on. Again here this is uh, quite intuitive because we all have been working with Flower so we can create in a virtual machine in this case for this example. This is not in the A4US platform also we can do it in the platform but here I have created a client in a virtual machine in our own cloud, in our own data center. And in order to connect when we want uh, to have the server deployed in the platform, we just need to introduce the endpoint of the server, which is here, and the token that we have implemented here with AI for Flower, Beerer, Beerer token. So we just enter here the token and we are able to connect. We can see here in this function from Flower, from start client, you can see that we have entered a new parameter which is called credentials and is the parameter that we use to authenticate the connection of the clients with the server. And this is the classic approach that we get when we are training a federated learning model with a Flower, but you can see some things that are new. For example, here, all this part is regarding the service of authenticating the clients and then we have just as usual, the federated learning started with Flower and we are requesting initial parameters and so on. And from the client side, the same, we have the same configuration, but first we have here information regarding that, the token that we are using to connect with the server. So in order to conclude with the A4US platform, just as conclusion, we can show how we can train a federated learning model and perform it with the server deployed in the platform. The clients can be allocated, for example, in other cloud machines, can be allocated locally or even in other deployments, also in the platform. We can use Visual Studio Code or JupyterLab as we wish in order to modify the code if needed. And we have implemented different extensions to the Flower library. The most important one that I have already saw is the one concerning client authentications because um, we have created, we have implemented the secrets management system in order to allow only authenticated clients to connect with the server. So here you have the code for accessing the platform is you, if you want to, to check information about it. You have here the web page and we are going to launch soon a call for external users for any other scientists who want to collaborate. And with this, I want to finish by just mentioning that the wide variety of use cases that we have, for example, agrometeorology, for example, automated thermography, integrated plant protection, medical imaging, and so on. So I expect that this is interesting for you, and thank you very much. Thanks so much. I, I really love the fact that this is going to be enabling for um, scientific, uh, you know, breakthroughs um, by allowing people to use distributed data um, so much more easily. Um, we have time for one quick question. Um, sure. Um, one second. 
Yeah, so my question is that, um, uh, so I think to ensure that only honest participants are there in the system, uh, so you have done something like a key, you have used some maybe big key, but the key is normally can be leaked even by the honest participants. So in the future, are you planning to do something like a public key encryption or maybe using something like a blockchain uh, to make sure that it is more full of proof and maybe better than maybe using a single key only. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. But here, for example, I was talking about uh, the case in which we may lead with clients that are not authenticating and want to poison the model, which is more common as we can expect because we have seen some examples. And it could be the case, for example, as I have mentioned, let's imagine that we are working on training a model for medical imaging and one attacker joins on a client and train a model with images from cats and dogs, for example. <laughs> that will be damaging the global performance of the model and that's what we want to avoid in some case, but just allowing authenticated clients to join the, to join the training. But that's also a, a good point that we, that we will take into, into account, yeah. Great, great. Um, well, thank you again. Thank you so much thank for being much here. Thank you very much,